As we continue our journey here in the Gospel of John, a very fitting passage of Scripture for a communion service because Jesus is now going to dig into this incredible controversy uh, of being in the temple, and he's going to make some statements that are so mind-bogglingly controversial that they remain controversial today. And so if you turn to John chapter 5, we'll pick up in verse 16, and we'll take down through verse 29. Uh, as we study the Word of God today. But as we do so, remember who Jesus is. We are remembering who Jesus is as we come to the communion table. But Jesus is God's own Son, and He is also God's only Son. He is the perfect Lamb of God. So what we've seen in John's Gospel thus far, He's the light of the world. He's the Creator God. He is in every way, shape, or form God Himself. And yet He is God the Son. And in that vein, Jesus now is beginning to do things that are upsetting the religious establishment, specifically the Jewish religious establishment. We've already seen as he heals this man at the pools of Bethesda, that man picks up his bed and is going to get in trouble with the Jewish religious leadership who are gathered in the temple compound. So Jesus is still in the temple. And when we say that in our modern understanding, we think of the temple as just the building. But that was not the case then, nor would it be if there were a temple on the Temple Mount today. The temple included the colonnaded area around the temple. It included the building of the Sanhedrin. It included the court of the Gentile, the court of women. It, it included everything that was the temple itself. And so Jesus could have been anywhere in that area. Likely he was outside in the court of Gentiles or maybe on the southern side where he would often go out the southern steps and actually teach people. And so Jesus is in the temple compound, but he's in earshot of those who would be doing business in the temple. Chief among those groups gathered on the southern side of the temple mount would have been the Sanhedrin. And the, these were, in essence, religious attorneys. Uh, they were men who were studied in the law, and they were to decide matters that directly pertained to Jewish law. And so as these men are listening, Jesus is now going to do a couple of things that's really going to bend their ears. So much so that eventually Jesus is going to say enough that he will be accused of blasphemy because he's going to equate himself and say he is, in essence, God. And as you listen in, you can almost hear the gears turning. You can hear it today in our world because people have a religious expectation very often. Not so much a relationship expectation, but a religious expectation of what church ought to be and how it ought to look and how it ought to function. Jesus was constantly breaking down those walls. He would remind them that it is in fact a relationship with him that causes us to come into a right relationship with God the Father by the forgiveness of our sin, and he does so with his own broken body and his own shed blood. Would you join me? Let's pray. We'll pick up in verse 16 here in John 5. Father, we again have come to this place, your house, to study your word. And we pray that as you speak to us, that we would hear these words that were authored by your Holy Spirit, written down through the Apostle John. Lord, that record your own words spoken to those who thought they had a right relationship with you by the law. But it is only grace that can save, and that only comes by faith. And we pray that our faith would be encouraged and that grace would grow in us today as we study your word. Bless your word as we hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 16, John 5. And for this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So you can kind of see that the heat is starting to get turned up. Now imagine, think about it for a moment. They, they had a reason as a Jewish man has now been healed to actually be upset with him, but it makes no sense given what the man had gone through. 
Because for 38 years, he had gone to the pool of Bethesda. He was unhealed. Jesus heals the man, and now they're mad at Jesus for healing the man. Sometimes religion is like that. It doesn't get upset about sin or something that we ought to be upset about, but it gets upset about the way we do church. Or whether the communion table is arrayed in one way versus another way, or whether we do it on an evening service or a morning service, or whether it's done on a Sunday or a Thursday. It's amazing how many times we can miss the grace of God because we're just simply clinging to legalistic tradition. And boy, did these guys miss it. And Jesus answered and said to them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. And therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said God was his father, making himself equal to God. So if you thought that Jesus wasn't clear, it was very clear to them. And so now Jesus has gone from breaking the Sabbath to blasphemy. And I want us to look at this together because this is, this is one of those passages, at first glance, people sometimes skip over it. It just seems almost too controversial. But Jesus does, in fact, claim to be God. He does it in an in a indirect way, but it is very direct if you're a Jewish person. It would have been monumentally direct, as is noted in this passage, if you were a member of the religious ruling leadership in the temple area. Jesus does so much claim that he is God that it gets him a death sentence. So when somebody says, well, Jesus never said he was God, don't ever say that to a Jew. Because the Jews believed fully that Jesus declared himself to be God. That's exactly why they sought to kill him. He was very clear. You see, Jesus is now going to do all kinds of things on the Sabbath. He, his disciples are going to get in trouble for picking grain on the Sabbath. He's going to actually fix a withered hand on, a, on one man, I recorded there in Matthew's Gospel. He, he is going to, time after time after time, do something that should have made perfect sense if he was, in fact, God. Because in that sense, what Jesus was doing was what his own father had always been doing. They were always one. And in that sense, all Jesus is doing here, and it's so easy for us to see when you just think about it for a moment, all Jesus is actually doing is doing exactly what God the Father is always doing. Because God the Father is always turning water into wine. He just does it infinitely more slowly, amen? He causes water to water the plants, the plants suck up the water, the water goes into the stalk and then into the leaves and then it forms grapes and those grapes become the basis of the wine. But God the Father invented the plant and invented water and invented the soil, so he's always making water into wine in that sense. God the Father is always turning wheat into bread, he, he's the one that gave the person the mind to think, well, let's, let's thresh this, let's grind this, let's turn it into flour, and let's make it into dough and then turn it into bread. That's all God's work in this world. God the Father's always healing people, isn't he? Sometimes he uses doctors and nurses and medications and all kinds of equipment. He, he does so over time. All Jesus does is simply say, rise up and walk. Jesus is proving who he is as he does these things. But what he's saying is God the Father is always doing these things. So he was saying, I and the Father are one. So the Jewish religious leadership is saying, he's blaspheming. He's declaring himself to be Jehovah God. You see, when Jesus said, my Father instead of what they usually said, which is our father, he was saying, are you saying that you are God's son? Which the answer to that was, yes, he was. 
It's exactly what he was saying. You see, Jesus did, in fact, claim to be equal with God. They're working together. They were doing what they were doing because Jesus is exactly who God is in that sense. Think about it. What did Adam and Eve lose? They lived in the Sabbath. When Adam and Eve were first put on this earth, they lived every day in the Sabbath. They were always at rest. They never had to work. They simply walked through the garden and said, thank you, Jesus. So what they threw away was the Sabbath rest that God designed for us to have. And all Jesus is saying, look, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So he brings it into view for them. Let's look at some things. Let's continue on here in this journey. Verse 19 and these incredibly controversial claims. And Jesus answered and said to them, For most assuredly I say to you, Jesus now speaking, the Son can do nothing himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. You, you talk about bending some ears of some people who believe they only knew, they alone knew how to relate to God. The Jewish people had, in essence, kind of, kind of the only, at that time, would have been the only monotheistic understanding of who God was. And so Jesus is saying, look, I'm doing the same thing God the Father's doing. I'm doing it how he does it. And he says in verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. There's going to be some seriously greater works, amen? Can I tell you who some of those works are? It's you. You're a greater work. You're a much greater work than healing a blind man. Because actually you were blind and now you see. But in a much greater sense, you were also dead in your trespasses and sins. You were destined for a life separated eternally from God. And he's fixed that problem. Way bigger deal. Amen? So he's going to say, I'm going to show you some greater things. I want you to marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. To as many as will receive him, to them, he gives the, the ability, the power to become the sons, the daughters, the children of God. Those who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. You see, Jesus is going to go on and say some way more controversial things. When people say, well, you know, this whole biblical Christianity thing is just too exclusive. It is really exclusive. It is the narrow way that leads unto life. And furthermore, it is the only way. And that's not what I'm saying. That's what Jesus said. We'll get to it when we get to chapter 14. Jesus makes the most exclusive statement found anywhere in Scripture. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. That doesn't leave the door open for any other world religion. It doesn't leave the door open for you to relate to God however you feel like you should. The way is narrow, and few there are that find it. As recorded in, in Matthew's Gospel, it is narrow. But it's also open to absolutely everyone. Because it's by grace through faith. It's not religion. It wasn't the law. It was the fact that you could say yes to Jesus Christ and be saved. Incredibly simple. Faith would be given to you. Notice how he concludes this particular paragraph. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. You realize, combining what he's already said, he's just declared himself to be God. Fully and completely. Whatever honor you give to God the Father, you need to give to God the Son. And guess what? I'm God the Son. He's making no mistake about it. He's not hemming and hawing. He's not dancing around some proverbial bush. He's saying, I'm him. And what I'm doing, I'm doing because he sent me and he made me 
exactly as he is. I'm God. We're one. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You see, he claims to be completely equal. That's why when we're back in chapter 3, the Gospels all begin someplace in the early chapters with, Behold, my beloved Son. There's a reason for that. There's only one name. It's at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Gets Jesus in massive amounts of trouble. Either Jesus is who he claims to be or he's a liar. So when he starts proving by miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, can you imagine, you ever wondered why Jesus took the time to spend 40 days after he was resurrected on this earth? You would think after the time that he had spent on this earth doing all the things that he had done, that once he was resurrected from the dead, it's just like, man, if they don't get it by now, they're not ever going to get it. That's how good God's grace is. So Jesus stays around for 40 days, and the book of Acts actually records that at one time he appeared to 500 people at once. Now maybe you have done something in front of one person and they remembered it and told somebody, but I can guarantee you when you do it in front of 500 people, 500 people turns into thousands very, very, very quickly. I saw him. Yeah, I saw him too. He, I was, there was a whole group. We were standing there and he appeared to all of us. Jesus was validating who he was. I'm not dead. I'm very much alive. And because I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me, though he should die, he will not perish. She will not perish. You will not perish by believing in him. He's just saying, look, I am who I say I am. And I can prove it to you. It's interesting when you look at the history of the Jewish people because the great rabbis basically held a, a, number of, a number of things that they claimed Messiah would be and they were all attributes of God the Father. And they were keys basically. They believed that God the Father alone held the keys to heaven but he would one day give them to Messiah. They believed that God the Father held the keys to, to human life, to the womb but he would have eventually give them to Messiah. Uh, the keys to the grave, he would give them to Messiah. So, so Jesus, as he's doing these things, each time he does these miracles, he's saying, you already know these things, and now I'm going to do them. You already know what you should be looking for, and I'm doing them right in front of you. And then he would go on to add all kinds of things in this one passage. The key to judgment, the key to honor, the key to salvation. He's saying, I alone can do these things. By claiming to be the judge, he's claiming to be God. By claiming to have the authority to raise people from the dead, he's claiming to be God. You see, so when we worship Jesus... When we go to the table, when we celebrate communion, we're saying, we believe that you are God. And you died for us. You took my sin. You took Jeff's sin on yourself to the cross. And you paid the price. It's so monumentally unbelievably hard to understand but imagine for a second because by the works of the flesh no one is justified Paul makes very clear if you took the cumulative good of all of humankind throughout all of human history and you could somehow collect it all and assign it to one person it would not be enough righteousness to save them so when people say well I just believe that you know I can be saved by works what kind of works would you have to do to become as righteous as God? And the answer is there aren't any. You couldn't do it. You'd never get there. You'd always fall short. And so when Jesus is saying, 
that if you honor me, you honor the Father. And if you don't honor me, you're not honoring the Father. He's saying, the honor that I'm due is the same as the Father's honor. The glory that I'm due is the same of the Father. He's making it really clear who he is. So by the time he gets to the cross... They should have known fully, completely who it was that they were putting to death. It shouldn't have been a mystery. And yet they still cry out at his trial, we do not want this man to rule over us, give us Barabbas. You see, it just shows how religious you can be and still miss the relationship. Jesus claims to have the authority to raise the dead. Notice verse 24. Just take the rest as most assuredly, verse 24 says. You see, because the one thing that all cults have in common is they deny that Jesus is God. And very often he becomes one of many, one of many prophets, one of many good teachers. He becomes one of maybe uh, hundreds, if not thousands. If you're a Hindu, they're just limitless gods. But that's not what your Bible declares. Your Bible plainly declares that he is the one and the only Son of God who is himself God. Most assuredly, I say to you, do you have a King James Bible that says, verily, verily, I say unto thee. Jesus is saying, look, you need to get this right. This is a truth. I'm declaring it a truth. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. He's saying, look, if I'm the same, if I am God, and you believe in him who sent me, and you believe in me, then you have eternal life. It is believing that brings one to the right relationship with God. It is not baptism. It's not the sacraments of the church. It isn't belonging to an organization. There's no such, thing, no such thing as salvation by organization. You could join every church on the planet without confessing Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior and you would still perish. And in saying that, I'm like, oh, I can't believe you would say that. The reason I'm saying that is it's true. He's the only way. He's one of one, not one of many. And that's what's missed. Most religions say he's one of many. Or he's a really good guy. No, he's not a really good guy. He's really God incarnate in human flesh. Amen? It's such a huge distinction. Because if Jesus is just a really good guy, then he's really not God and he really can't forgive your sin. But he's really God and he died for you. And because of believing in him, his sacrifice in your place, you now have eternal life. You don't have to die for you. He did it for you. For most assuredly, I will say to you, the hour is coming and is now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. He's saying, look, I have the power of resurrection. I can literally raise the dead. And as the Father has life himself, so he has granted it to the Son to have life himself. And as he's given him authority to execute judgment, also because he is the Son of Man, He's he's, he's saying, look, I am God. And what God can do, I do. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. He's saying, look, there's a time when you're going to be judged. The good news is you can either be judged in Jesus Christ and be absent from this body and present with the Lord, or you can be judged on your own merit at the great white throne. There in Revelation chapter 20, read it. The last six verses of the chapter make it very, very, very clear. 
that you can either choose life in Christ Jesus as Lord, or you can choose to try and stand before a holy God whose name is Jesus at the great white throne and make your own case for your own righteousness, and it will not be sufficient. You see, when we back off of making Jesus God, when we say he's just a great prophet, we have made him no longer the Savior. Christ is holy. He is God. He is nothing short of God. And God died for you. God died for me. He describes four resurrections here, and I want to move through them, the first three, quite quickly. Bottom line is, because of Christ, one day you're going to be resurrected unto eternal life. Amen? Amen? It's plain truth of Scripture. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I am saved by grace through faith. That's not of myself. It is a gift of God, and it leads to eternal life. Praise the Lord. The moment you say yes to Jesus, you are alive in Christ. Amen? So you, that's a guarantee. That transactional righteousness is placed in your account. You're still guilty of your own sin, but Christ has paid the price for it, and you now have that penalty placed on the back of Jesus. That's why he went to the cross. His body was broken in your place. Instead of you being broken for your sin and dying for your sin and shedding your own blood for your sin, he did it in your place, and his perfect righteousness has now been placed in your account. Praise the Lord for that resurrection. That's coming. To prove that, Jesus himself was resurrected. He said, I don't want you to miss this, so I'm going to be the firstborn of the dead. Just so you don't think that it's an impossibility, he himself was raised. And so as he's wandering around showing himself for 40 days to all those in the region, he's basically saying, it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. Thomas, come over here for a second. Put your finger right here. He was declaring himself to be exactly who he said he was. So when he declares himself to be the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me shall not perish but have eternal life, when he declares that, he proves it. The third one. You're all going to experience it. Whether you do it one at a time by taking your last breath here and being absent from the body, just exactly as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 declares, and being present with the Lord, or whether the Lord comes and takes his church home all at once, you're all going to experience that resurrection. And when you get there, according to what the Scriptures declare for us, you are going to have a new body. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When you get home this afternoon, just pull it out. You're going to get a new body suited for heaven. Man, I cannot wait, amen? The, the weight of that pecan pie and turkey <laughs> bearing down on the cellular level of my fat, <laughs> causing my girth to expand one day, I will be in the heavens. I can eat all the pie I want. No, I'm just kidding. But you see, one day you're going to be resurrected unto new life with a new body. You have a natural body, but you're going to be raised in a spiritual body, and people are going to know you as you were known. It's this beautiful picture of having a body suited for the heavens. You were originally made of the dust and for the dust, but you're also going to be renewed in a new body suited for heaven. And by the way, he's not going to need all the parts that you had here to do it. So if you're worried about, you know, well, what happens if I get blown into tiny bits? I'm sure God knows where all your atoms are. Which, by the way, just in case you've ever wondered what this whole thing is, if you watch the news reports and there's been a bombing anywhere in the Middle East, and whether it is the Jewish people or whether it is the, the Islamic people, Muslims, 
The reason they're looking for all the bits and pieces and parts of every single person is they believe you need them all in order to be resurrected. If God can't resurrect you from, uh, he's got a problem. If he can't resurrect you from whatever's left of you. If you've ever noticed, you know, when people laid in the ground for a while, they're kind of not themselves. <laughs> so whether that happens instantaneously or whether that happens over time, God knows where all your parts are. He can take care of that. So rest. I've had people come, oh, what happens? Big God more than able. I'm going to ask the communion team to begin to hand out the elements of communion now. And as you receive them, you're going to receive the bread first and then the cup, and I would simply ask that you would hold on to both elements and we'll partake once we receive both elements. But I want to share with you this fourth resurrection because that's the one that really is problematic, and if you're a believer, you won't actually be there because it's the great white throne. You see, you won't receive condemnation from the Lord. He's actually saved you from it. And so you don't need to worry about what the Bible calls the second death. You're, you're not going to be at that one because you will all have already have been glorified. But what the Lord has really done for us is given us a cause to remember. He, he is the only reason that we get to go to heaven. He did pay the price. You will be resurrected. And he proved all these things by himself being the first one. So now you know why. Jesus, when he spoke to the disciples, he told them, do not worry. For I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you might be also. And if it were not so, I would have told you, but it is true. I go to prepare a place for you, for in my Father's house are many abiding places, many mansions. You see, the price that was paid for you was enough to pay for your ticket to heaven. That's the reason that Christ's body was broken. That's what he did at the cross. And this simple passage actually gives us a picture of what he did. It's a very simple outline from these verses. And if you include verse 30, you get all seven of them. Jesus came to this earth for the express purpose of paying the price for you. That was God's will. God sent his son. The Father's work was always to save. He wasn't just eternally angry because of what Adam and Eve did. He was eternally loving from day one. That's why he covered Adam and Eve's sin, and that's why he sent Jesus to pay the price for yours and mine. Furthermore, he revealed all this stuff to us. He could have just kind of left us on our own, but he gave us his word, and Jesus lived these things out so there would be zero question about why he was here and what he was doing. So when Jesus, as we'll celebrate here in a moment, when he said, this is my body broken for you, he was declaring that what Isaiah said was true. The chastisement of our peace would be placed on him. By his stripes we are healed. Not by your own stripes, by his. God revealed that to us. So we'd know we would have zero question about the marvelous work of the cross. It was also the Father's power. Look, family, there's no power in this simple matzah cracker. But there's power in the name of Jesus. This just represents what he did. And so what you hold, and I'm going to encourage you, the pieces are big enough, you can break them before you take them. He was broken for you, so you wouldn't have to be broken. He was pierced, the little holes in it, for you, so you wouldn't have to be pierced. He was stained and tainted, the little brown marks that are on your matzah, they're all a picture of Passover, by the way. 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was God the Father's power that allowed Jesus to endure the cross. And he endured it for you. It was the Father's judgment. So when God the Father looked on Jesus, the reason Jesus said to Telestai, it is finished, is because it completed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. And God the Father looks, and behold, my Son in whom I am well pleased. It pleased the Father to bruise him, the Apostle Paul would write to us. Why? Not because it was a beautiful thing. It was a horrible, ugly thing, but it was the only thing that could take care of your problem and my problem, my sin and your sin. We had to be judged for it, and so Jesus was judged in our place. You ever thought about Jesus being judged in your place? Every single thing that you have ever done that's displeasing to God, Jesus bore that on Calvary's cross and he was judged instead of you. It was his judgment that honored God the Father. And so because of that, God has highly exalted him. The honor that belongs to God the Father was placed on Jesus the Son even though Jesus the Son bore your sins. Even though he took the weight of the sins of the world upon him, he is worthy of honor and praise and glory. The same honor that God the Father has in heaven, the same regal authority that God has, Jesus the Son, bears with him to this day. And as we celebrate what he did on the cross, we honor the Lord. When the Father gave life to Adam and Eve, he breathed the Ruach Elohim, the very breath of life of God, into mankind. Nothing less. It wasn't some different kind of life. So when Jesus said, I came to give you life, And that more abundant, he's talking about the life we're supposed to have in the Lord. So as we celebrate at the communion table, at the cross of Christ, we're celebrating the life that only he can give. There's no other place you can get this kind of life. It's not found in material things. It's not found in blessings of this earth. It's not found in a great relationship with someone here on this planet, though your relationship with your spouse should look like the one that we have with Jesus. It's only found in him. It's the Father's life. And next time as we see, it is actually the will of the Father that we should have all these things. When Jesus came, he was on a mission. The cross was not a mistake, family. The cross was not a mistake. It was not a clever plot by Ananias, the high priest. It was not overwhelming power of the Roman government and Caesar. It was not that the apostles failed Jesus and didn't protect him. Jesus went to the cross because that's what he came to do. And so when Jesus himself took the bread and he broke it, he said, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do so in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. And then after supper, Jesus was reminding the disciples, he says, look, 
Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Your sins can't be dealt with. They're not taken care of. My blood is sufficient to cleanse all of your unrighteousness. Not your blood, not your service, not your money, not your whole life. None of that would be sufficient. His blood is the only thing that's sufficient. So he took the cup, the third cup, after supper. And when he drank from it himself, he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the remission of sin. As often as you drink of it, you do show forth or you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's partake together. Would you stand with me and let's pray and thank him. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came and completed all of your Father's work, that that revelation was complete. There's nothing else that needs to be done. Lord, that same power that raised you from the dead will one day raise us from the dead. That the judgment for our sin and the penalty of it was already paid by you. And we now honor you we glorify you, we praise you, Lord. We do remember you. We thank you for giving us eternal life. We thank you for the cross. Lord, we bless your name that you set aside the glories of heaven and you came to this earth that we might have eternal life. We bless you for what you did on the cross, your broken body, your shed blood that's purchased our salvation. We believe in you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.